I'm delighted to introduce Jim Mars, author of Rule by Secrecy and most recently Inside Job, who tonight is going to make a presentation on future technology from the past. And without any further ado, I'm going to pass uh, the mic on to uh, Jim Mars. Sorry, I'm kind of getting in the way here. Am I good? Am I good for the camera? Okay. Have the mic working? Okay. All right, we're going to move real quick here because we don't have the time that I would really like to expend on this, but I think this is kind of a complicated uh, subject and a subject that most of you are probably totally unfamiliar with, So, uh, but I am going to hurry on through this because I think it's very important and I think it may give us an insight into our unparalleled and unsupported mad rush to occupy Iraq. Slide. If you go back to the Bible, you find what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. We think that we have the leading edge in technology. We are the apex of the world's civilizations. But I don't think this is true. More and more, despite the foot dragging and, and uh, uh, naysaying by archaeologists and uh, historians and everything else, we are more and more coming to learn that apparently at one point there was a planet-wide highly technical civilization on this planet. And something happened, uh, war and or geophysical changes or both. And what we think of as our history, beginning with the Sumerians, coming up to the Egyptians, Babylonians, and now up to the Greeks, Romans, Western civilization, of course, is what we're primarily talking about. Uh, that is nothing but the remnants of an earlier prehistoric civilization. The evidence is everywhere the round balls of Guatemala, the pyramids all over the world, in China, in South America, Central America, Egypt, the ziggurats in Mesopotamia. All of the evidence is there. But it's only been within the, about the past hundred years that we've had the technology and or the knowledge to know anything about it. We are still pulling ourselves out of the dark ages. Let me start with a fellow named David Hudson. He was a Phoenix area farmer, and when I say a farmer, this is not a guy with a mule. He was a multi-million dollar uh, farm corporation. But he was having a hard time of it in the Phoenix area because the heat, the drought, it would dry up the soil. He was really having problems. So he uh, got the bright idea of, of uh, putting uh, various uh, acids and chemicals into the ground to see if he couldn't loosen up the soil. And when he did, he noticed that there were some very odd properties to this soil. Slide. He used a copper electromagnetic cell to separate the, the metal from the ground, and he began to come up with these strange little sparkly mineral things that he couldn't quite figure out. And so he took it to some local chemist and local uh, geologist, and they couldn't quite figure it out either. And it turns out that actually what he was dealing with was an unknown, heretofore unknown property, a monatomic element. Slide. He named it an orbitally rearranged monatomic element. Interestingly enough, ORME we find in ancient Hebrew meaning the tree of life. Isn't that interesting? And the reason he named it this, because these were single atom elements, okay, that uh, were derived primarily from gold, silver, platinum metals. And uh, slide. He, this was back in the 70s. By the late 80s and 90s, we see a number of scientific papers. This is being very much talked about in the scientific world, but is still not known to the general public, and it's pretty esoteric. The single element, single atom elements, can be rearranged by orbitally changing the nucleus of the atom. Slide. Now what he found was very unusual. When he was able to separate these monatomic elements from the uh, ground and from other elements, it produced, and under certain heat and heating procedures, he was able to produce a white powder. 
And when you put the white powder in a weighing pan, they found out the pan weighed less than it did before you put the powder in it. So it had some sort of anti-gravity property to it. Then it got stranger because they found out that if you heat treated it to a certain degree, the white powder would disappear. Well, now they get really got excited because they thought, uh, wow, you know, here's invisibility perhaps. And, of course, then he started attracting attention from the big guys because who wouldn't want an invisible tank or an invisible plane? But what they found out was is that they'd stir around in the weighing pan, you know, and say, gee, I wonder where it went. And then when it cooled off and came back to the white powder, it was in the exact same configuration as when they first put it in the pan. In other words, it didn't just disappear. It went somewhere. Okay, so now we're finding that this manipulation of this atomic material can shift it into another dimension. All right? So now they're getting excited because, hey, maybe this is the key to understand unlocking faster than light drive, limitless free energy, dimensional time travel. And they also found that it had uh, physical properties that you could ingest the white powder and that it basically didn't heal you. It cleaned up your DNA and make you where you didn't have to be healed. So now we're talking about perhaps longevity because we all know that every few weeks or so, every cell in your body is regenerated. There's not a cell in your body today that's the same cell that was there, say, 10 years ago. All right? So why can't we live for hundreds of thousands of years if we just keep regenerating our cells? Because at the end of our DNA strand is what they call the telomerase caps. There's a cap on our DNA. And when it gets to a certain time in your life, those caps kick in and you quit reproducing the cells. And what happens then? You age and you die. Oxidation. Slide. Now, we know today that the structure of the atom is a lot different than what I was taught in school. This is Walt Disney's version, you know, our friend, the atom. And we now know the atom is composed of all these various things, which I won't bore you with, mainly because I don't even understand them myself, because I don't claim to be a scientist or a highly technical person. I'm just a reporter, okay? Slide. But the atom is totally different. But we also know that in the atom, the nucleus, and then you have your electrons and protons and neutrons. The atom is mostly space. This is what I mentioned earlier about the fact that even our reality, everything we think is really hard and solid, is really just made up of atoms, and within those atoms is an immense amount of space. And yet within those spaces, the, the energy generated by these neutrons and protons and stuff is absolutely immense. And we're finding out things about this continually. They, they recently found out that protons have mass. Okay? It's a complete surprise to me. I didn't even know they were Catholic. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> All right. Slide. They also found that by treating these monatomic elements, you can change the shape of the nucleus. And you can turn it into a dumbbell-looking thing. And I found that really intriguing because, of course, we all know that that looks very, very close to what the symbol for infinity is. So what we're dealing with here is the basic, build, basic building blocks of life, energy, the universe. Slide. <clears throat> it also could be what we're learning to adapt as fuel cell technology. Uh, they are finding that, uh, you can read this for yourself, these are some fuel cells that they're experimenting with with United Technologies, and it's all based on energy conversion uh, rather than fossil fuel or burning something or whatever. So in other words, this, of course, this technology we're talking about would have be of intense interest to energy executives and anyone who is heavily invested in the energy field. I'm going to here to tell you right now that there is tons of alternative energies out there. The reason we don't have it is because the big guys have not figured out how to get a monopoly on it. If we go to hydrogen, you can take an electrolyzing plate and you can separate, uh, you know, what's water? H2O, two part hydrogen, one part oxygen. So you can sep sep separate that through electrolyzing and you can get hydrogen. So we could all get enough hydrogen so, you know, you can't get a monopoly on it. Biodiesel, biofuel, 
You know, we can all grow some potatoes or corn or whatever, so they couldn't get a lock on it. They're going to fuel cell because they got to figure out what to put in those fuel cells to make them work that we can't get, mm -hmm. and then we'll get it, mm -hmm. okay? You all live, most of you have lived through the time when the cigarette industry was fighting tooth and toenail, and for every scientific study showing that cigarette smoking was harmful, they had their scientific study showing that, well, their methodology was wrong, or no, it's actually good for you, or whatever. This was a delaying tactic until those giant cigarette companies could diversify, uh, okay? Today, uh, the big cigarette industry's uh, cigarette sales still into the millions of dollars is still only a small now only a small fraction of their total profits because they diversified in other things. This is we're in the middle of this now with petroleum. Mm -hmm. They know the writing's on the wall. They know we need to get away from this, but uh, they've got to drag it out until they can diversify and find a new technology to go with. Slide. Interestingly enough, this dovetails into the ancient stories of the alchemist who are trying to transmute base metals into gold. And we've all heard about that, and probably like me, you snickered at that, now, like, poor fools, think they take a piece of lead and transmute it into gold. But you can, if you can learn the secrets of this energy manipulation at the atomic and subatomic level, okay? Because they have taken gold, transmuted it into this white powder, the white powder of gold. And then they have taken the white powder and transmuted it back into a gold nugget. Can be done, all right? But they are just now beginning to crack into this technology and this knowledge. Slide. And again, we find it's nothing new because in the Bible, we learn about manna, Moses, uh, the manna from heaven, and they said it came from heaven because they'd wake up in the morning and this white powder was strewn all around the ground. Well, you know, and they know nobody came in, there weren't any footprints. Nobody left it there, so it must have dropped from the sky. No, they were producing it on Mount Horab in the southern Sinai where uh, back in 1901, Sir William uh, Petrie of, uh, of archaeological fame in Britain discovered what he called an Egyptian temple. And today they call it the Mount of Moses. And they think this is where Moses went. And I've talked to people who have visited there, and they said within sight of this are some mountains where they have ancient gold mines. And there is a foundry in this facility, and this is where probably they were manufacturing this white powder of gold. In fact, Petrie recorded that when they got there and they tore up the flagstones, they found all this white powder there. But they didn't know what it was. So they just, the wind blew it all away. This is, this is ancient knowledge. They knew how to do this. We, we learned that Ramesses the Great offers conical white bread to the hawk-headed god of Hathor. And then down here we see Amenhotep III receives the conical shim -ana, or the Methus, okay? And all of that basically means the same thing. Manna in ancient Hebrew means, what is it? They didn't know what it was. But certain of the priesthood, some of this knowledge which had been passed down from earlier civilizations had been passed through the priesthood through the knowledgeable people, and they knew how to do it, but they didn't know what it was. So it was manna. What is it? Slide. Uh, you read in Exodus, when the dew had gone up in the face of the wilderness, a fine flake-like thing, fine as hoar crossed on the floor, hoarfrost on the ground, and when the pe people of Israel saw it, they said to each other, What is it? Manna. For they did not know what it was, and Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And they would take his powder, and they'd mold it into little cakes and stuff, and they'd eat it. This was the manna that helped them survive in the wilderness all this time. Was this the white powder of gold? Slide. Um, this is really great. When Moses comes down off the mountain, and uh, he'd been gone for a long time, and he'd gotten the commandments and everything. And the children of Israel had gotten pretty impatient, and uh, they were wanting something better than their lot hanging around there. So they, had, they knew something about the gold was magical and had real spiritual property. So they gathered all their gold, and they built a golden calf, and they were worshiping it. When Moses comes down, he got real angry about it, and he says, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tables out of his hand. He broke them at the foot of the mountain. 
And he took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire, ground it to a powder, and made the children of Israel eat it. Okay? What the heck there? So we have these tantalizing things that, there, that this is a technology that was known back as far as biblical times, slide. And then I've already mentioned Mount Horeb. This is a picture of Mount Horeb. And it holds the ruins which included this smelter where apparently they had uh, been, and where Moses was actually manufacturing the white powder of gold, slide. And of course... Moses, and we could get into a huge long discussion here, because there seems to be some compelling evidence that Moses is not a name, it's a title, and it means the one true heir to the throne, and that Moses, in actuality, we know from the Bible that Moses was a well-schooled in Egyptian, he was a high-ranking Egyptian, uh, you know, and so there's a compelling argument to be made that has been accepted by many people like Mark Twain and, and uh, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and many other students of uh, hidden history that Moses was just kind of a title and the actual pers person was Amenhotep III, the Pharaoh, who then had changed his name and incurred the wrath of the Egyptian authorities when he became Akhenaten, the uh, worshiper of the one true God. And that's because he had learned about the one true God through his Hebrew uh, relatives or the people who had actually raised him, okay? Now, where did the Egyptians learn all this from? From the biblical patriarch Abraham, who had brought the knowledge of Samaria to Egypt. Look in the Bible. Abraham was not a Jew. He was not even a Semite. He came from Ur of the Chaldees. Chaldea was simply an ancient term for Samaria or Mesopotamia, what we now call Iraq. And there are the city of Ur is still over there, Uruk. A lot of these towns, in fact, most of those cities in ancient Samaria were named after Abraham's relatives, okay? So Abraham was not just some poor Jew wandering in the desert with a camel in a tent. He was a very prominent and probably royal Sumerian who brought the knowledge of the ancient Sumerians to Egypt. Shortly thereafter, the whole Egyptian civilization sprang full-blown into existence. And what I found in researching Rule by Secrecy is that it was surprising to me. The earliest dynasties of Egypt were the most advanced. So the Egyptian civilization did not start, you know, from a primitive and then build into this exquisite civilization. It started off as an exquisite civilization and then digressed and devolved. And all of it because of the information that goes back to Samaria. Slide. So we can see that Abraham comes from Ur of the Chaldees, goes up to Haram, comes all the way through Canaan, and ends up in Egypt. Slide. All of human history resides in Baghdad because that was the fountain of Western civilization for certain. Slide. The ancient Sumerians obviously knew a lot more than we even give them credit for. In this steel, we see that they made a representation of the solar system, correctly depicting not only the number of the planets, but the relationship of their size. This steel dates back probably about 6,000 years, far beyond the time of the Egyptians. It also shows Uranus and Neptune. Uranus was not discovered until 1781, Neptune in 1846, and Pluto, which they correctly show in their diagram, was not even discovered until 1930. So see, we're not the apex of knowledge. We are just now regaining knowledge that was here centuries ago. Slide. We have the example of the Baghdad battery. They found this years ago, it's just a little ceramic jar with a little... Uh, copper tube that went in another little copper thing, and they couldn't figure out really what this was until somebody thought to put some grape juice in there, put the tube in, and put the little copper point in there, and what happens? Lo and behold, you get a half volt of electricity. So they knew how to generate electricity, and they didn't have a huge power plant. They just do it with a jar and some grape juice. They knew the manipulation of energy at the atomic and subatomic level. Slide. 
And how do we know they knew all this stuff? Because of the Sumerian clay tablets that are still in existence. There are over half a million of them. 500,000 of these tablets are known to exist right now, and only about 20% of them have been translated. Isn't that amazing? Some of you young people here, if you want to know what to do with your life, learn to translate Sumerian. Okay? It was the world's first writing, and what they did was they used a stylus, and they would press it into mud uh, with these little uh, triangular-shaped styluses, and, uh, and then they'd bake it. It's a rock. That's why they still exist. Paper, papyrus, that all burns up, just, you know, flakes away, but these things still exist. These writings predate the Bible by 4,000 years, and they tell of human origin. Slide. Not once, but several times, according to Sumerian tablets, they say 432,000 years before the Great Flood, the Anunnaki came from Nibiru through the Great Bracelet, which is the asteroid belt, to the earth. And here they landed in the Persian Gulf and began to colonize and search for gold. There were strikes over the hard work, and it was decided to engineer a slave race by manipulating the DNA of primitives. Kings and dynasties arose once this slave race came into existence, and warfare broke out, and that's a thumbnail sketch of what they say our history is. And it does answer one big mystery. For centuries, they've been looking for the missing link. We know Neanderthal existed, and then there was Cro-Magnon, modern man, and they've been looking for the link in between. For years, they thought that there should be something in there because they must have mated and interbred, but now we know for certain that they did not interbreed because they are two separate species. And there is no missing link because they manipulated the DNA. Slide. Gilgamesh, the legendary Sumerian king, the world's first epic novel, thought to be mythical, and yet now they have now found what they believe is the tomb of Gilgamesh. The story is amazing. You really ought to read the story of uh, Gilgamesh. He, along with his non-human companion, Enkidu, and we don't know what, who or what Enkidu was, perhaps a robot, perhaps an organic robot, perhaps an alien, who knows? But it, they made it very clear that he was not a human. And they go in search, trying to find the ancient gods, looking for the secret of immortality, longevity, the secret of the white powder of gold. Slide. Recently, among the f amazing new discoveries that these French and archaeological, uh, French and German archaeological teams were finding in Iraq beginning in 1999, 2000, 2001, was using ground penetrating radar, they really believe that they may have found the tomb of Gilgamesh under the Euphrates River. Slide. But anyway, they were finding all of these amazing new discoveries. Did they find the secret of the monatomic gold? Did they find the secret of longevity, of free energy, of time travel, star portals? If you can manipulate energy, you can go to another, another dimension. You could probably create a wormhole. You could probably go to another star system, and there we don't have to worry about the problem of spending hundreds of years blasting along in a, in a fueled, propelled rocket, you know, that it would take you to get to another star system. You jump through a wormhole, and you're there. Or you jump through another dimension. But that brings us to Baghdad in April of 2003. Where would they have taken all these amazing new discoveries? They would have taken them to the Iraqi National Museum in Baghdad. And would they have immediately put them on display? No. They would have been put in the basement where they would have been cataloged and cleaned up and prepared for exhibit. But in spring of 2003, George Bush, against everyone's wishes in the world, invades Iraq. I went through this earlier, but the weapons inspectors, both ours and the United Nations, said there's no weapons of mass destruction. The Atomic Energy uh, Agency of the United Nations said there's no weapons of mass destruction. Even Saddam Hussein, at the last minute, was finally going, okay, okay, whatever, send in the weapons inspectors, do what you want. Bush would not take yes for an answer. Okay, we were going to invade, and we did. 
And what we do, against all military logic and tactics, instead of going for an objective, seizing your objective, solidifying your wins, and then moving on to the next objective, we made a beeline for Baghdad. This is what has created the problem in Iraq for the United States today because we failed to pacify the countryside. And what happened in Baghdad? Well, they put a Marine Guard on the Ministry of Oil, but there was no guard on the Iraqi National Museum, although several museum officials from around the world had already secured the promises from the Pentagon that they would protect the priceless treasures in the Iraqi National Museum, but it didn't happen. Slide. This, by the way, is uh, uh, the English version, and on the back is the Arabic version of some uh, uh, fly uh, flyers that the, that the military occupation forces were handing out. The coalition will destroy any viable military targets. The coalition does not wish to destroy your landmarks. We do not wish to harm the noble people of Iraq. To ensure your safety, avoid areas occupied by military personnel. So, you know, we went in there and said, you know, everybody clear out because we don't want to destroy you. And yet, even to this day, uh, we are continuing to bomb and to destroy some of the most sacred and ancient places in Iraq. Slide. And this is what the Iraqi National Museum looked like after the looting. Everyone concerned said the looting was a, done by an organized band. Now, there were probably and undoubtedly some, just some street people, some thugs that were hired to go in to give it the appearance of a looting mob. They went in, they sacked a lot of the upper floors, broke into exhibits, this, that, and the other thing. Slide. 170,000 items were looted. Slide. Ancient things dating back God knows how long. Gone. Slide. Safes opened up. Vaults opened up. Slide. Slide. But, of course, we did guard the oil ministry. <laughs> Slide. Now, oops. Marine Colonel Matthew Bogdanos, Deputy Director of the Joint Interagency Coordination Group that investigated the loot looting of the Iraqi National Museum on orders of General Tommy Franks. The basement is what we've been calling the inside job. And I will say it forever like a mantra. It is inconceivable to me that the basement was breached and the items stolen without an intimate knowledge of the museum, without a plan, without a conspiracy. From there, about 10,000 pieces were taken, and we've only recovered 650 approximately. That was in an article in Archaeology in January, February 2004. Now, what was in the basement? All the new stuff. Did they get the secrets of the monatomic gold? Slide. We go back again, and we, we learn, and I'm sure some of you have heard that Saddam Hussein considered himself the reincarnated Nebuchadnezzar. You didn't know that? And he was building, rebuilding Babylon, right? So maybe that was another reason we had to stop him. He might have been trying to restore the grandeur that was once there in this prehistoric civilization. Well, then that behooves us to take a look at King Nebuchadnezzar, and of course we mostly have to go to the Bible, but we find that King Nebuchadnezzar built what the Bible preachers will tell you is the fiery furnace. But what it was actually, and they give you the dimensions of it, it was a, it was a big portal made of gold. Okay, again gold figures into all of this. Was he trying to make the white powder of gold? Well, he wasn't having much success, and he would send his people in there, but he, he was getting an energy field going because they'd go in there and they'd die. Does that sound a lot like the Ark of the Covenant, which a lot of people theorize may have been a capacitor to uh, manufacture the white powder of gold? Okay? So it, it really angered Nebuchadnezzar, so he goes and gets three Hebrew priests, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he brings them there to Babylon, and he says, I want you to make this work for me. And they said, well, you're not our king, and you've conquered our people, and we're not going to work for you. And he says, well, all right, then I'm just going to throw you in there, and then you're either going to sink or swim. You're going to die, or you're going to get this thing working. Because what was Nebuchadnezzar trying to do? Same thing as Gilgamesh. Contact the ancient gods and learn the secret of immortality. Okay? So he takes Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, uh, but interestingly enough, they don't just take them and throw them in there. 
First, it says they don their hats, coats, and other garments, put on their radiation suits or whatever. And they went in there, and they're walking around in there. And Nebuchadnezzar, he's leery of the whole deal, so he's standing back to ask his minions, are they in there? Yeah. Are the, all three of them in there? Well, actually, there's four of them in there. Four? Who's the fourth one? The Son of God. Where'd this guy come from? Again, an indication that this could have been a portal to somewhere. And if it was the Son of God, I'd like to know what happened to him because there's never any more mention about that. But after this, whatever happened there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out and Nebuchadnezzar praised them and made them ranking people there in Babylon and gave them the run of the place because apparently they, these representatives of the Hebrew priesthood, knew the secrets or some of the secrets of the monatomic gold. Slide. Now this brings us up into more modern times. We find out that apparently the Nazis were onto this. We all know from the Indiana Jones movie that the Nazis were all after these occult things and the Ark of the Covenant and everything else. Why? Because they were religious? I don't think so. They were after these ancient secrets. They were after the ancient secrets of energy manipulation. And they began to get some of these secrets because they developed the world's first practical jet fighter, the ME-262, the V-2, the V-1, and when they overran Germany in 1945, what's on the drawing boards? Flying saucers, UFOs. They were working on them, and I have good reason to believe they were actually test flying them. In fact, if that war had stretched on maybe even another six months, there's no telling what they might have come up with. And who was in charge of all that? A very mysterious SS general by the name of Hans Kammler. He was in charge of the, all of their leading-edge technology. And he's the one that bought Werner von Braun and von Dornberger and the rest of them from Pinamuna and brought all the rocket research down into Munich. Why? I think because they were closer to the American lines and they wanted to give up to the Americans because they knew they'd be well-treated and they knew that they could work their way into America, which is what they did through Operation Paperclip. Now, according to von Braun, he wanted to resume testing of the V-2s and uh, Kamler told him, no, I'm going to hand the V-2s and you folks over to the Americans in exchange for immunity. But a little later, he told Von Brown, I'm going to disappear and you're not going to hear from me again. And sure enough, he dropped from sight. And even though there were reports that Kamler was seen in the United States in the 50s and early 60s, there is no record of what happened to him. But we know that he did not turn over the V-2s or the V-1s. Okay, but yet if he was in the United States and if he did survive the war, what did he hand over to the Allies in exchange for immunity? The secret of anti-gravity, the secret of the white powder gold, the secret of the manipulation of energy because he was also tied to experimental work that was done at what essentially was a super collider, super collector in western Poland, the ruins of which are still there. Slide. And we have a lot of tantalizing evidence that the Allies did get hold of such technology because in this article from the early 1950s, the gravity engines are coming, the G engines, meaning gravity. And we have huge, very prominent aviation pioneers like L.D. Bell saying, we're already working on nuclear fields and equipment to cancel out gravity. And Bill Lear, developer of the Learjet, all matter within the ship would be influenced by the ship's gravitation alone. They were beginning to crack the door open on the secrets of the manipulation of energy at the atomic and subatomic level. But bingo, it all goes dark. It's like it didn't happen. And when they finally rolled out the Avro car, which was a joint saucer development between Britain, America, and Canada uh, in the... Uh, Late 50s, they rolled out this flimsy-looking thing that wobbled around a little bit, and they said, gee, it didn't work. Was this simply a cover for their anti-gravity research? And this leads into the fascinating speculation of, is there a dark, shadow government-run alternative space program? And it even gives me the thought, you, and some of you may be well aware of the controversy over whether or not we actually went to the moon, because of the problems in weight and in thrust and in the 
the expen expansion or uh, expendable uh, of fuel, the expending of fuel, et cetera, et cetera. Radiation, because the, the Van Allen belt stretches, according to Van Allen, for thousands of miles further than NASA wants to admit, which means they would have been bombarded by intense radiation, which would have been fatal. So how did they get through all of this? And there seems to be a legitimate controversy over that. And yet, I have spoken to the astronauts, and, and I'm still not prepared to say we didn't go to the moon. Perhaps we went to the moon using technology other than what we've been told. And maybe even the astronauts themselves don't know. Perhaps they were put in a rocket, and the rocket was shot into space. And during that period when they're blacking out and, and not all with it, the anti-gravity kicks in and they're, they're pulled or pushed through this super technology. Speculation. But it could explain that anomaly. And we ha now ha also have General Nathan Twining's memo of 23rd of September 1947 where he's talking about UFOs. And he says, the phenomenon reported is something real not visionary or fictitious. They knew at the beginning in 1947 that this was all real. September the 23rd is an interesting time period because this was just two months after the crashes in Roswell, New Mexico. It's also the same day that President Truman signed the National Security Act of 1947. This is what's done us in, folks, because we all know that the National Security Act of 1947 created the CIA. We know that it uh, changed the name of the War Department to the Defense Department, a little PR change. But what a lot of people don't realize and or haven't really understood is that it also created the National Security Council. Now we all have heard of the National Security Council because even up to the invasion of Iraq, everything's done through the National Security Council, which by definition takes care of anything having to do with national security. But who can tell me who the National Security Council is? President, Vice President, Secretary of Defense, and, and State. Four people. Did you all hear that? The President, Vice President, Secretaries of State and Defense. Three of those are appointed by the President. So it's the President controls the whole, anything having to do with national security. This is where we went into the national security state. This is why, because creating the National Security Council, anything having to do with national security, it bypasses Congress, bypasses the Constitution, bypasses the media, and hence bypasses the public. And this is why they've kept the lid on UFOs. Why? Because they don't want people to know our deepest darkest secrets, which is they are tampering with the basic building blocks of the universe manipulation of energy at the subatomic level. Slide. And by the way, in that same document, Twining says, it is possible within the present U.S. knowledge provided extensive detailed development is undertaken to construct a piloted aircraft which has the general description of the object in subparagraph A, meaning a UFO. So in 1947, they were basically saying if we had a crash policy, we could build our own UFOs, and I think they've done it. And that's why when, uh, but don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that every UFO sighting is some sort of secret government test craft. A bunch of them are, but not all of them. In fact, there is good evidence to suggest that we are in a undeclared, uh, under the table, covert war with extraterrestrials, and we're not being told about it. And it kind of makes a mockery of freedom and democracy, doesn't it? And here's the Avro saucer, and they're all going, well, gee, it just didn't work. And that was the end of that. And this has never been talked about. In fact, to this very day, some of you probably understand what I'm saying. If you go to our centers of higher learning, or if you go to the large corporations, and you start talking about anti-gravity, they call the security guards and have you run out as some kind of nutcase. Because this has been so thoroughly blacked out because it is so real and it stretches back so far. Slide. So now we do know, and these pictures have suddenly surfaced, that they were building long past the 1950s Avro car. They did have flying saucers operating, and they were able to fly. And the question becomes, were they powered by just some sort of exotic jet, as they would have us believe, or do they have anti-gravity? 
I've had people very conversant in the aviation field tell me that the SR-71, Blackbird, stealth fighter, that it looks like it really shouldn't be able to fly. So there is some theory, theory that, yes, it's got jets on it, and yes, they roll it out, and you can see it flame and go down the runway, and it all takes off, but there are leading edges of certain material, and there are some electronics on board that they can kick on, and that we are actually using anti-gravity right now, okay? And what I would like to know, and the big conundrum is, do the pilots even know, okay? Maybe they're told this is a some sort of system, you know, flip this switch here, you know, you, have, you know how you do an aircraft, you got to, everything's written down, you just flip stuff, and you're, you're told basically how everything works. Maybe they're told it's the cooling system or something, you know. So, again, we have technology that obviously stretched back through all of human history that's being kept from us. Slide, although I think that's it. Okay. Here are some of the recent sightings of these giant triangular craft. Are they them or us? Are they human ingenuity? Are they shadow government test craft that they're using? Or are they reverse engineering of ET craft? Or are they, and what are they being built for? And why would they test stuff? All of y'all familiar with the uh, flyover Phoenix, Arizona, back in 19, when was that, 97, I believe it? Yeah. Okay. That's a big deal. Big triangular craft. Went over Phoenix, very slow, turned, moved off. But here's a good example of how they cover these things up. This occurred about 8.30 at night. Thousands of people saw this thing. And uh, then sometime between 8.30 and 10.30, somebody contacted the Maryland State Guard and ordered them to fly a training mission to Phoenix to the Barry Goldwater Gunnery Range and drop flares. So about 10.30 that night, they did just that. Now, the Phoenix papers were full of this story the next day, but it never went anywhere else. Remember what I said about the distribution of the news? But three months later, in June of 1997, USA Today suddenly did a story on this thing that flew over Phoenix, and all the rest of the magpie journalists, they all went, and all of a sudden there was a brief blurb about this whole thing, okay? Well, the official version was, of course, that, well, it was just flares dropped by the Maryland State Guard. So some of the reporters who were a little bit ahead of their fellows actually contacted the Maryland State Guard, and they said, yeah, we flew out there and we dropped flares. And they went, oh, okay, case closed. It was just flares. They dropped over military flares over Phoenix. Nobody bothered to check that they dropped the flares two hours after they saw this thing fly over the city. But the key part of that story is, is that it didn't only fly over Phoenix, one of the most populous cities in the state, but came down the entire length of the state right through the most populated corridor. Now, if it's a secret government test craft, why in the world would they fly over the most populated area? Why don't they go down to Big Bend in Texas? You know, you could fly around there all night and nobody but, you know, some prospector in a, in a, in a uh, coat would see you. It's amazing. Are they setting us up? for the next game after the war on terrorism? If the war on terrorism collapses and all of a sudden nobody's buying that anymore, what's next? Invasion from space? Yeah, give up the last of your liberties so we can protect you from invasion of space. I'm gonna leave you with one cheery thought, okay? As we can see, there's lots of evidence that perhaps the reason we had to go into Iraq was to grab these ancient secrets of energy manipulation, the secrets that could open up limitless free energy, which would wreck the oil economy, of course, longevity, which would wreck the medical establishment, the pharmaceutical uh, corporations, which are all based on petrochemicals, by the way, and et cetera, et cetera. Perhaps that's the reason that we had to invade Iraq to get our hands and get control over this ancient technology. But what worries me is that right now, as we meet right here today, somewhere deep underground probably, there is a covert government-sponsored lab where we have scientists working on this. And they are tampering 
with the basic building blocks of the universe. And why does that bother me? Because in the spring of 1945 at Alamogordo, New Mexico, when they set off the first atomic bomb, more than half of the scientists working on the Manhattan Project sincerely, devoutly believed that once they started a nuclear chain reaction, they would not be able to stop it. It would ignite the atmosphere, and it would incinerate the Earth. But they set it off anyway. Whew. Glad we were wrong about that. That's pretty scary. Somebody says, well, let's try this. Flips a switch, and the whole universe winks out of existence. Now, again, it, maybe it's just because of my libertarian instincts, or maybe it's self-preservation. But I think we need to know about this stuff. The time for this military industrial secrecy is over with. If we're going to continue to call ourselves a free people, we have to have free knowledge of what the heck's going on. Now, I was in the military. I was even in Army intelligence. I do realize that there are some secrets, strategies, uh, disposition of troops, etc. There are some secrets that need to be held in true national security. But when they're dealing with all our lives, all our futures, all of our possibilities for life on this planet, I'm afraid that that goes a little bit beyond just national security. Now, thank you for your time. All right. I, th I thought I'd kind of run over my time there a little bit. Believe me, I hurried through that. There was a whole lot more we could have talked about. We'll start and go this way. Yeah. Are you pointing at him or me? Yeah. Great, thanks. You left off with a comment that may be related, if not to come back to a little bit later, about who are they? It was before this. Oh. So just to plant that seed and that's my interest. Okay, we, you saw what the Sumerian tablet said. The Anunnaki come down, okay? And uh, these are these ETs. They colonized the planet, apparently, okay? Now, one of the problems they had was they started interbreeding with these, their worker race, okay? And this produced the men of renown that the Bible refers to as the Nephilim. Go back in uh, Genesis and read what it says. It says the sons of God mated with the daughters of men and created the Nephilim. They are the hybrids. It's us. And then the hybrids, of course, kept going, and, and that's why on down today, we're all related to these star people, because that's where we came from. But now there are some among us who are more related than others. And this is why, beginning with the Pharaohs, the Babylonians, and the Egyptians, and the, the Caesars, and the kings, the monarchies of Europe, the Nazis, what was their big concern? The bloodline the bloodline. You, whoever the rulers think that they have the right to rule the rest of us human cattle because they uh, are of the more direct bloodline. And that is your they. Okay, now we could get into names, some of which you would recognize like the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, but then there's other, lots of other names, the black nobility of Europe. Go get a roster of the Bilderbergers and you'll pretty much figure out who they are. No, no, no. They created them while they're here. In fact, um, he, uh, this fellow back here pointed out that, that it didn't all start in Mesopotamia. It started in Africa. And he's absolutely correct, okay? But if you read the tablets, you'll find that the... Oh, it gets complicated. But uh, there was a being known as Enlil who was the mission commander. And they, they, initially, they landed in the uh, Persian Gulf. And initially, they began to try to extract gold from the water. But that was a slow, tedious process, and they weren't getting much gold. So that's when they decided they had to go out and start excavating for gold. And so now you find ancient gold mines in Africa, in South America, in uh, China. Okay, so they were all over the world, okay? And eventually, they built up this worldwide civilization, which then somehow collapsed, either through wars and or uh, geological, geophysical changes, okay? But their science officer was a, a being known as Inky. And Inky and Enlil were actually half-brothers. And so there was some rivalry there because uh, over who was going to be commander. 
Enki ends up, this is all according to these tablets that predate the Bible by 4,000 years. Enki ends up in the Abzug, which has been translated as Africa. And it was Enki, they were, there were some strikes, there was some revolts among the Anunnaki who said the work is hard, we don't like being in these mines, digging for this gold. And so they were having some problems and they were trying to figure out what they're going to do. And by the way, the reason they wanted the gold was for various reasons, perhaps to produce energy, perhaps to, uh, for this white powder manipulation, but primarily to take back to their home planet to repair their ozone layer. And this is the exact same thing that Edward Teller and others have proposed in, in repairing our own ozone layer is to put gold, powdered gold, which is a highly conductive metal, and seed it into the upper atmosphere to seal off these ozone holes. Okay, so they said, okay, what are we going to do about this? And Enki is the one who said, well, I got a solution. Instead of abandoning this planet or, or killing all the workers because they won't work, why don't we create a slave race, a worker race, okay? And interestingly enough, they had the same arguments that we have. They said, well, it's not up to us to play God. And his counter-argument was, was that number one, we're not playing God because we're not creating some new race. We're just tweaking the DNA of an existing being, okay? And two, we, it's, it's, we need this so that we can get the goal we need and all like that. And his view prevailed. And then in the tablets, they tell you how this was accomplished. They took the ovum of a primitive earth female, shall we call her Lucy? <laughs> and they impregnated it with the sperm of a Anunnaki male and then implanted the fertilized egg in the womb of an Anunnaki female who carried it to term did not have a natural childbirth, but had a cesarean childbirth, and it produced what they call the Adama, the Adam, the first hybrid. Okay, and initially these hybrids were like mules. They could not procreate. So they had to keep creating all their workers, okay? It's a long, lengthy, fascinating story. But eventually there was the, the whole thing here, but eventually they finally tweaked it to the point to where the mules could reproduce and this is where we have modern man. Yes? What about scientists that have mysteriously died or disappeared? Any connection with these laboratories underground? Are you talking about the uh, bi microbiologist? Yes. yes, that's pretty spooky too, because I am well aware of that. There's a whole spa How many are there now? 14 or something like that? 18. There's a, a dozen or more of the world's most preeminent microbiologists who suddenly in the wake of the anthrax attack suddenly died or disappeared and never been heard from. Why? Because they could have told us where that anthrax came from, even though it's now leaked out that it was weapons grade and that it could only have been produced by the United States. And yet nobody has been caught. Nobody's been prosecuted for this. Deadly attack. People died. And it also worries me because if there is another major anthrax attacks against, a, against some civilian population, say in Los Angeles or San Francisco or whatever, where are the guys who are going to come say, well, here's what you do about it. Here's the anecdote. Uh, I just wanted to add something to that. Uh, there's some people think that these microbiologists were connected with the study of gene-specific diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that maybe SARS is a representative mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that can uh, that can affect different populations that maybe have blue eyes or, or black skin or, or whatever. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the Israelis like to prevent a like to uh, design a disease that would only attack Arabs? <laughs> I know it. That's the problem. In fact, yes, that, they've been working on that ever since Vietnam. In Vietnam, they were trying to come up with some, uh, with some pathogens that would attack Asians. It's really spooky. That's why I say we've got to get rid of this secrecy. We've got to get rid of this national security state for our own protection. Because, see, here's the whole key to freedom. If I allow any law, any policy which restricts somebody else's freedom, I'm not free. Because once you allow that, then what's to protect you? Nothing. The, you know, Pastor Martin Neumuller in Germany pretty well articulated that. He said, well, he came for the Jews, but I wasn't Jewish, so I didn't say anything. 
He said they came for the uh, uh, for the uh, Masons, but I wasn't a Mason, so I didn't say anything. Came for the Gypsies, but I wasn't a Gypsy, so I didn't say anything. He said when they came for me, I didn't hear anybody turn to. The only way that we can guarantee our personal freedom is to guarantee everybody's personal freedom, even the ones you don't like, even your skinhead Nazis, even your weirdos, even your, you know, yes, even the Republicans, you know, we've got to guarantee everybody's personal freedom because once you get the ball rolling in curtailing freedom, then there's no stopping it and there's no guarantee that you won't get caught up in it and they'll say, everybody with a beard, you go to the camp. Okay? Yes. Connection with Antarctica and your earlier parents, your presentation. So I've like heard a bit about it, but I'm not that clear. About Antarctica? Oh my God! Well, we could we could have another whole whole presentation on that. That gets into Agartha, the Nazi base down there, Queen Maud's land, which they renamed No Schwaben Land. That was where all the submarines were heading after World War II. Uh, the, and then you get into the more modern times when they found the lake under there, like Vostok, and the warm lake under Atlanta, uh, Antarctica. There's all sorts of stuff going on in Antarctica. Perhaps this is one of the places where they are studying these microorganisms. Because if you'll recall, they suddenly had a bunch of doctors and medical personnel that they had to evacuate out of Antarctica. And by the way, I don't know if it's still that way, but at one point they pretty well had sealed off. Antarctica is one of those places that us free Americans really can't just go to. You know, you can't just say, oh, I want a ticket to Antarctica. I'm going to go down and look around. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. But to me, the main concern with Antarctica is the Ross Ice Shell because it's melting. All right, uh, the North Pole. The U.S. Navy uh, meteorological station at the North Pole said there will be no ice at the North Pole by 2015, which is pretty close. Okay, now that's not a big deal, because um, at the North Pole, all the ice is sitting in water, so the volume will be the same. You're just going to have water instead of the ice. Okay, but Antarctica is a different situation. You've got the Ross Ice Shelf, which is a huge, you know, probably the size of Texas or even bigger, that's sitting on a landmass. And it's not even, it's kind of at a slant, and it's being held essentially by an ice pin, okay, that's keeping it from sliding off into the South Atlantic, and that ice pin is melting, just like the North Pole. And by the way, they talk about global warming, but let me tell you something, it's bigger than that. The ice caps on Mars are melting. They, the sunspot activity, they say, well, we're going through a cycle, but it'll calm down, but it hadn't calmed down. Uh, there are other um, perturbances that they've noted on some of the other planets. This is a solar system-wide thing. Now, it doesn't mean it's doomsday. Doesn't, maybe it's just cyclic. We don't know. We haven't been here that long. But it's, And I'm not trying to say there's no global warming, but it's not just global warming, and global warming is not just the results of our energy policies and automobiles, although that's certainly obviously not helping matters. But the problem with Antarctica is if the pen melts and the Ross Ice Shelf slides off in the South Atlantic, it's going to raise the water tables around the world by about 12 feet, which would inundate New York, London, probably Paris, you know, San Francisco, Los Angeles. You know, we're having a real problem, okay? And this probably will all happen within our lifetime. So, so what do you all do about it? Uh, Beats me, you're going to have to decide for yourself. But I know I'm in a very solid place in Texas, and I have an underground house with a log house sitting on it, my own well, and, you know, I'm, I'll just, I'm there. And, I, and that's no guarantee, you know. I, I've, since coming out here, I've had a lot of people tell me, there's going to be a terrorist attack on September the 27th. Oh, no, I'll be in Australia, you know, so a lot of good is going to do me, right? So <laughs> what I say, my game plan is hope for the best and plan for the worst war with us you... they're not at war with us we're at war with them okay. because they want to keep this they want to keep all this secret uh, according to several sources they have approached the leadership of the world various national leaders and they said okay you know we'll make contact let's deal you know we'll swap technology but you guys got to promise to lay down your weapons start learning to get along with each other yada 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 and the national leaders have said we don't want any part of that I'm in control here, and I don't want to give it up. And that seems to be the problem. And that may indeed be the reason for these abductions, because they have given up 
on trying to contact national leaders, and now they're just making individual contact with ordinary people and slowly. If you all think back, say, 15, 20 years ago, if you talked about, if I stood up here and mentioned an alien abduction, you all would just run me out of the room. It's like, well, you're just a crazy man. And a lot of you probably still thinking, I don't know about this guy, but at least we've gotten to the point now where we can talk about it. And another 10, 15 years will be, oh, yeah, yeah, I know somebody had an alien abduction, or maybe they're here. You know, we have to acknowledge that they're, uh, that this is a real issue and that it is real. And it's like Twining said in 1947. It's not, it's not hallucinatory or fictitious. This is real. And it is real. And let me tell you something here. If you guys, obviously you all are interested in what's going on in the world, or you wouldn't be here today. But let me tell you something. If you try to figure out what's happening in the world today and try to figure out geopolitics and you turn your back and ignore the UFO ET connection, you'll never figure it out because you're mix, missing a big piece of the puzzle. And that's why, we, that's why we're in such difficulty here. you got guys in Washington who, they don't want to hear anything about UFOs. Go to the news media. They run you out of the office to try to talk about UFOs. So how can they possibly figure out what's really going on because they're ignoring a big portion of the, of the equation? i got a lot of questions. Oh, my God. What about the whole fundamentalist thing, and the born-agains, and the prophecies, and Armageddon, and what's going on in the Middle East, and Israel? Well, that comes back again. Well, uh, well, okay, uh, the, the, the fundamentalist. Why are they call fundamentalists? Because they say the Bible is the inner right word of God, and you believe everything that's in there, especially that verse that says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So let's go burn the witches. Where's the witches? Well, then you go back to study history. Back in the Middle Ages, they burned the witches. And who were the witches? Number one, women. Number two, they were uh, uh, mid midwives. Midwives. Okay? If you were a midwife, you were pretty much suspected of being a witch. Okay? Then they go back again. But is the Bible the inerrant word of God? As a Christian, I'm a little torn on this because on the one hand, I really do want to believe that it kind of is. And in a general sense, I think the philosophies that are in the Bible are good, solid works. I think that it was an inspired work of writing. But what you have to understand is it's been edited. It's been jacked with for centuries. Another thing I found in studying the ancient Sumerian tablets, they tell you all about the flood. Okay? They tell you all about the flood. God came to this guy and said, hey, build an ark. Use pitch and beam and to seal it. And, uh, you know, put all the seed of every living thing in it. And, uh, and, and the, the, ark, the flood came and the ark rode it out for 40 days and 40 nights and ended up on Mount Ariat. Exact same story you see in the Bible except in their tablets. The guy's name wasn't Noah. is up in Pishkin. And this was 4,000 years before the Bible was written. Okay? So the Bible may be the Word of God. It may be full of truths, but it is an amalgamation of history and stories and Sumerian history and things that have been passed along word of mouth. You know, most people don't realize that the Bible was not written down as a written document uh, up to within 300 years of the time of Christ. Okay? That's how recent all that is. Before that, it was word of mouth. And have any of you all ever played the parlor game where you get a line of people and you, one whispers a sentence and you pass it down? It gets pretty garbled in the translation, okay? Then that's the problem we have. But it even gets worse than that because then you get the Council of Nicaea where the Pope Constantine decides, Here, here's what goes in, here's what stays out. Oh, this, this kind of promotes women in the church. We don't want that. That goes out. You know, uh, da, 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 okay? So you've got to understand that the Bible in fundamental ways may be very true and may be very inspired, but that in details it's been, even the Bible scholars will tell you, it's been heavily redacted, which is a fancy word meaning edited. <laughs> okay? Is that it? Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Jim. And, uh, you know